Hi, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon um, for our latest uh, in a series of, of um of webinars on uh, clean, clean innovation. Uh, and so today around clean innovations for improving the energy efficiency of homes. Uh, got a great uh, slate of speakers, um, lots to get through. I think you can see them there on the slide. Um, my name's Sam Goodall. I'm International Programme Manager for Cambridge Cleantech. Um, I'll really just be introducing um, today's session and then handing over to Peter Bates from PJB Associates, who will essentially be chairing the, the session. Um, I'm also joined by my colleagues, Oriane, um, Camilla and Sylvie. I think Sylvie's only going to be in the, the session partially, though. Uh, he'll be on hand to help for any, any things that uh, we need sort of sorting out or, or kind of organizing throughout the event. Uh, so my first task is, is just to go through a few kind of housekeeping rules that uh, just make the session run smoothly for everybody. So step one, um, if ask everybody to, to make sure their phones are muted and that they, um, I think, are muted are in, on the microphones, or is that automatically the case if they're audience? But uh, yeah, so, uh, or, so I think that's for speakers. Please mute, mute your phones. Okay, the event is also being recorded and will be available uh, after the session on YouTube, I think, tomorrow. Uh, I think I've mentioned already that my colleagues are, are, are in the meeting. Um, and if you could, if you'd be able to provide the details of who you are within the chat box, uh, we've previously had a lot of chat going on throughout the, throughout the sessions, and that's a great way of, of getting some interaction and interest in terms of what's going on. Um, in relation to that, if you have a question, because there is a lot of chat that generally kind of flies around while the speakers are, are, are kind of doing their thing and so on and so forth, if you could specifically mark it in question mark, uh, in, in capital letters with question. So start it with question in uppercase, and that will be picked up by Peter, who will be kind of moderating that chat, looking for those questions as we go through. Um, there is going to be a break at the halfway point. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how long is that for, Ian? Uh, short break, three minutes. <laughs> so um, kettles on standby for that, I think. Uh, we'll sort of uh, yeah, drain the national grid. Um, and then at the end, there'll be a breakout session with the different speakers kind of um, kind of leading different rooms, different groups. But I think Oriane will explain how that's going to work at the end. Um, I think that's all of my uh, kind of uh, housekeeping things. Uh, just leaves a couple of things uh, to cover off uh, around events that we have ongoing at the moment and, and opportunities that you may be interested in. Um, I think you all know who Cambridge Cleantech is, but super quickly, we're a, a networking organization. Um, we represent corporates and, and SMEs, particularly looking for innovation search and helping to broker those technology relationships and also investor relationships. Um, and the, the opportunities we're talking about, I'm just going to introduce you now, are, are in that space. So something we've just recently launched is a Slack networking platform. Um, and if you join that, and details will either be in the chat or, or kind of emailed out um, uh, to you uh, uh, post the event, then we've got 40 tickets tickets for I'm not sure what the next event is or what's the next event that the free tickets are for um Peter will mention it after it's it's on uh, it's from the sustainable smart home um, okay so the mission as well. there'll be free tickets for that uh, that event uh, for those that join the slack platform um yeah so that event opportunities and challenge for electric vehicles so my, my mistake yeah that, I did know what that was <laughs> um and um, the other thing is, and this is one of the core activities we do, this is a meet the buyer event where one of our kind of corporate partners have expressly given us a series of challenges that they would like our membership to try and help them meet around kind of technology search. Uh, First Base, they are a, they are a, a developer. Uh, they have a number of developments in, uh, in Cambridge that they're bringing forward and they're looking to tech for technology they can bring into those developments. Um, so in particular, they're looking for building integrated PV solutions, air quality solution, both indoor and outdoor, future mobility, so EV charging, hydrogen, heating energy efficiency, storage balancing, phase change materials, 
water reuse efficiency and sustainable urban drainage systems. Um, details of that, again, I think they'll be shared in the chat, but also are available on our website uh, under our kind of uh, under our kind of opportunities for members, well, an opportunities general section. Um, I think that's everything from me. So unless Orian tell me I've missed something, but otherwise I will hand over to Peter, who will introduce the speakers and and take you through the rest of the event. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, and welcome everybody to the uh, this event, which is focused around clean innovations for improving the energy efficiency of homes. And I'm very pleased to say we've actually got um, something like 100 people uh, listening and watching in today. Um, very quickly, I want to uh, just explain what the Sustainable Smart Homes Group is. It's a special interest group of Cambridge Clean Tech, and the main focus uh, is looking at the UK market, and it's something like 27 million homes, uh, many, uh, many of which need deep retrofitting and installation uh, of renewable energy services um, uh, be before uh, 2050, or even earlier now, as we've had a Prime, T Prime Minister announcement in the last day or two, uh, about 60, about 78 percent of carbon emissions uh, need to be achieved by 2035. Uh, that's based upon 1990 targets. Originally, it was going to be 80 percent by 2050. So our prime minister has set a uh, in the UK anyway, our prime minister has set a, a major target for us to achieve. Um, just one other thing before I go into the main event, uh, there's also a LinkedIn uh, group uh, and if you just do a search on sustainable smart homes, you'll get uh, to the LinkedIn one there. So welcome to Earth Day. Um, apparently it's been going since 1970 and apparently last year there was 100 million people uh, what, uh, involved in Earth Day on the um, uh, 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 online in, in that respect. Um, I actually hadn't heard of Earth Day uh, at all until fairly recently, uh, but it does seem to be a very appropriate day uh, for a number of things to be happening, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Um, my, my recollections of 1970 are very much more about European Conservation Year, so I knew nothing about Earth Day at the time. It's very interesting. I, I um, had my first geographical magazine. Uh, I was just about before I, I was going off to college to teach training college at the time. And it's very interesting. I, I had a look at an old copy of the uh, mag magazine. And even 50 years ago, 51 years ago, it was talking about the biosphere and it's talking about the technosphere. Uh, for those people who are familiar with the circular economy, uh, uh, um, there we go again, 50 odd years on biological materials and technical materials. So it has been ticking along in terms of conservation, uh, natural regeneration, uh, and also talking about um, uh, reducing pollution, which is now all encompassing within climate change. That's been going on for more than 50 years now. And even today in the news, um, we've actually had, there is this virtual um, climate change conference being held uh, by the White House and Biden is pushing for an immediate, um, uh, is doing an immediate push for, um, uh, for his summit action. I was just literally trying to find it on my uh, uh, phone and apparently he has announced today at via the BBC um, alert that he's pledging to cut US greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030 compared to the 2005 levels in that case. And as I mentioned before, um, Boris Johnson also made this announcement uh, about his uh, cuts in carbon emissions. So some quite dramatic kind of uh, pronouncements made by the policymakers. And of course, we've got COP26 coming up um, in November as well. So we can only today focus on a small aspect of that. And we're focusing on retrofitting the home for climate change. I've got a number of, of speakers 
uh, and I've really kind of grouped these speakers into th uh, three different types. We have to address the social and human factors, behavioural factors, uh, in order to get the majority of people, or the vast majority of people, on board about making those improvement measures for climate change. Two, of the, uh, two ways forward in that is more sophisticated censoring and monitoring, uh, and equally so is looking for innovative retrofit building solutions. We've got to start to move more rapidly now. You know, we, it, the target has been set at least for the UK uh, to, to get most of those um, reductions in, in carbon emissions done now by 2035. So we have to start to seriously look at that. So I'm going to now move on. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to move that. We'll talk about the next seminar later. I'm going to now move on to our first speaker. What we've actually got today uh, is a number of speakers. Uh, and uh, with the exception of, of our keynote, first note speaker, Chris Fowles, who will be speaking uh, in, in a few minutes, uh, all the other speakers will, will be under a stopwatch of eight minutes each. Uh, and they'll uh, be coming up with their own solutions. So I'm going to just um, cancel my share, I think. And then that should bring up, um, hopefully bring, bring up uh, stop share. And we're now going to bring on to Chris. There will be a couple of opportunities to put any questions in the uh, uh, chat. Uh, and I'll stop for a few minutes for Chris. Uh, but then the rest of the speakers will have two distinctive breaks uh, for them. So over to you, Chris. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to try with my video, um, but if if um, if the internet connection isn't quite so good, I'll, I'll turn it off. So please do interrupt me, Peter, if, if people can't quite hear me or if there's any, any issues. Uh, and thanks very much for the introduction and, and for kindly inviting me. Um, nice to see some familiar faces and to, to obviously connect with new people as well. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to have to step um, away uh, around the break time, and so I won't be there for the second half due to childcare. So sincere apologies for that, but I look forward to looking at the slides once they're circulated around afterwards. Uh, so indeed, my, my name's Chris, um, and I'm a Principal Research Fellow at the Global Sustainability Institute, uh, AIU in, in Cambridge. And most of my research has been involved, involves working with the people side of energy. So energy transitions, we do quite a lot of work with policy makers in, in the UK um, at a European level. And really a lot of my work is around uh, the, the social side, the people side. So um, in particular, not that I'll be uh, referring to them explicitly during the, the um, during my sort of next 10 minutes or so. Uh, but I did want to sort of point to these projects as sort of implicitly, this is sort of, I suppose, what a lot of what I'm saying comes from. Um, and uh, over the last four and a half years or so, we've coordinated these two projects. Um, and together, they're about 3 million euros. And they've, they've involved us advising the European Commission on the, the social side and the people side, the, the social science and humanities officially um, for their energy policy making, and in particular their investment in research and innovation. So uh, for Horizon 2020 and for the forthcoming Horizon Europe, uh, we've been there to, I suppose, offer guidance on if you're going to invest in um, energy tech, what can and should we maybe be doing if we're wanting to account more for, um, as the title of this talk says, that the human um, and social but behavioural side of things. So just to sort of note note this, um, and we've done an array of things from you know our monthly calls with the commission to uh, masterclasses with um, those driving energy technology solutions across Europe. Um, uh, in terms of accessing European funding and, and writing good proposals for, for uh, these sorts of things. Um, aside from that as well, I'll, I'll also be linking to, to this. Again, it will be something that's sort of hidden, hidden away and I won't really ever be referring to it. Uh, but we engaged a few hundred researchers all around um, the social side of energy efficiency. So we said to them, if the European Commission, if, if people funding innovation and wanting to drive forward energy efficiency are, are committed, which they are, to, to do more on, on the people side of things. What do you think 
you can offer them what what questions need to be answered and so i'll sort of be leaning a little bit on some of these findings and this this was submitted uh, to the commission last year and, and will form part of their their thinking i think for the next seven years worth of investment um, in what will be their cluster five on energy climate and mobility um, which will be a, you know, several billion over these next seven years or so, and 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 as part of the Brexit negotiations, you, the UK uh, UK are obviously eligible to apply for those those uh, research innovation funds. Okay, but that aside, what am I hoping to to emphasise? I'll be putting on some sort of arguments um, and general general messages and examples, really, which will hopefully emphasise these things. As Peter's already nicely explained, uh, it's, it's not all about the tech, obviously it's important, but questions of people and society matter. And I think if we start to look through these questions of people and society, so how, how energy efficiency technologies are experienced, how they're used, how they're developed, who benefits and how, all these sorts of things, then I think they can only aid the development and rollout. And, and hopefully ultimate, ultimate success of energy technologies more broadly, um, but in particular on the demand side um, of, of um, the energy system. And I don't think this is going away. I mean, as also Peter's nicely explained, the, the, the targets are now there. Obviously there's been a, you know, a, a bit of failure in UK energy efficiency policy in, in the last year or so particularly with homes, but we would hope that this would start to turn around. I mean, it has to if we're going to meet our targets. And certainly the signals from policymakers and funders are that they are going to start, um, you know, requiring these sorts of these sorts of um, ideas. Certainly from the, the funders and policymakers that I speak to who have firm interests in energy technologies, they're quite keen on what's called a mainstreaming approach, where like, although they're wanting solutions on energy tech, as part of getting the money, they really want this sort of mainstream approach whereby everything considers somehow people because they know that, that the, the success of the tech does, does require consideration of the people. Okay, so let's go through a couple of these examples and, and a couple of these points and do feel free to, to ask questions or challenge me or anything in the chat, I very much welcome that. Um, so some examples. Why don't we have a look at a few of these then? So I think the first thing to say um, is that a, a tech change is also a social change. And there's, there's a lot of um, examples and research that shows that when you give households, for instance, a technology, the way that they live and uh, would often change only perhaps in a subtle way, from before the technology to after the technology. So there would have been some sort of social change. So for instance, you look at cavity wall insulation, um, insulation improvements, which, which will affect how the home is heated. Well, that will change how uh, the you know, heating practice in, in the home, how people perhaps do certain things at certain times, at the very least, the temperatures that they're used to and the sorts of ways in which they maybe even dress or, you know, get up in the morning and clothe their children. Life changes when tech changes. You look at uh, smart, smart thermostats, there's obviously a, quite a big push on them at the moment. And similarly, you'll see that when you introduce smart tech that again the the ability to control things remotely or perhaps through sort of more of an automated fashion again will perhaps have uh, impact on the routines there's quite a lot of research around um, in-home displays and general energy feedback technologies particularly from around sort of five to ten years ago there was quite a lot on it some examples of some sometimes causing conflict or or power dynamics in the homes that that that's a, a debate aside but certainly uh, the introduction of more information around energy efficiency ideas does change sometimes dynamics in the home so again a one-off tech change can have longer lasting uh, social changes how people live so because of all this then it's not surprising that often technologies have unintended consequences so i've picked a couple of examples here from my phd actually from gosh 10 or so years ago um, where i looked at passive house technologies and homes and how people live with them and when they'd never come across them before and it was a sort of brand new energy efficiency tech to them so 
forgive me for sort of the you know the, the extreme examples but hopefully it just sort of demonstrates the the sorts of unintended consequences that that can happen and that people perhaps won't expect so um in a passive house home uh, it's uh, obviously got very low heating uh, heating energy you, you don't need to put a lot of heat into it the ones that i were looking at had had a boiler but you didn't really need to turn it on um particularly because they had solar panels that that did the that heated up the the thermal store and so you, you didn't really need to touch the boiler that, that was the general rule and certainly that was the assumption by a lot of the architects but actually one household was turning it on regularly often once a week and overriding the system and after after speaking to them it turned out that they were really interested in baking and they loved the temperature on the top of the boiler because it was perfect for proving their bread so again it's it's, it's a, you know a silly uh, unintended consequence something that you know it's difficult to prepare for in a way but again you don't know these things unless you work with and understand the users of the system similarly um, many people would use uh, water saving taps more often uh, would have would would use their water saving taps to have more baths than would ever be predicted because they liked the way that it bubbled up their bubble bath. Things like this that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of until I spoke and worked with over a long period of time, the users of these energy efficiency technologies. So again, I suppose I'm trying to emphasize that the success of the tech can often come from um, better preparing, sometimes adopting slightly different design or, or approaches or thinking about how the technology is handed over, the skills that are imparted, the information, uh, the support services that exist around it. Obviously, it depends upon the scale and the type of the system, but th these are some of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing. So all of this, I think, leads quite nicely into this idea of learning by doing and that people, at least from what I've seen, will tend to interpret their energy efficiency tech on the basis of the what they see as equivalent tech beforehand. So, for instance, I've seen mechanical ventilation and heat recovery systems fail to do what the designers thought would happen because they um, interpreted it, the controls, on the basis of their normal um, brick and block house with um, gas central heating combi type boiler controls. And the controls often are based on similar uh, different rules to, for instance, mechanical ventilation systems. That, I mean, you, you don't need to necessarily know how, how they work, but essentially different systems, but people applying their same sort of rules in their mind when they're engaging with the next system. So it immediately ensures that, you know, they're not going to perform as well as perhaps they'd hope. So people learn through doing and, you know, perhaps don't read instruction manuals, but just just do it through sort of experience, um, which means that they bring their past experiences with them in, in engaging with this technology. One minute left, Chris. Okay, so I think this this points to all sorts of things that would be good to engage with around ideas of justice, around who, what hats people are wearing. Um, this is something that's not going to go away, and um, I think there's there's ideas here around um, tackling fuel poverty as well and considering uh, vulnerable households. And my final point um, is that the success really of energy efficiency innovations is not just about looking at the end user, but also all the other users of these, whether they're policymakers who, who in, or supply chains or intermediaries that interpret um, and, and speak across stakeholders. There's all sorts of people in in the system and I think it's 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 important that everyone across the energy efficiency uh, supply chain sort of I suppose work with and consider how <clears throat> how their part of the system could be used interpreted by others um, so it's not just about thinking about users but also um, innovators themselves so yeah I think that that sums up I'll just put these here to, to emphasize it um, and also, if I may, Peter, um, just to sort of note, note this as well, uh, this is something that's going to be circulated around afterwards with much more details, but um, my colleagues at ARU um, have a lot of ex expertise in engaging with accessing funding um, for, I suppose, 
uh, responding to, as they put here, bespoke innovation needs. So if you're interested in connecting with academics at ARU, not necessarily around energy efficiency, around energy, around sustainability, around anything, then, um, then colleagues um, in, in our research and innovation unit are keen to speak with you. So yeah, thanks very much for your time. And Peter, over to you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, to my surprise, we don't actually have any questions from you at the present moment, but maybe if you can stay till the Q&A halfway through the session, great, and we'll be able to, uh, any questions. So just to remind people that in fact, uh, if you do have a question, pl uh, please put it into the um, um, chat and, and then also um, uh, make it quite clear who you want to, to ask that question to. Um, I will then ask those questions on your behalf um, to avoid time having to uh, jump between video screens, etc. in that respect. So I'm going to move on immediately to the uh, our next speaker. And can I just remind the speakers that um, you've got strictly eight minutes. I have my stopwatch, uh, which has just been reset. Uh, uh, and uh, if you can then, after your eight minutes, uh, or after you've finished, before the eight minutes, please do pass on to the next speaker and we'll have our next three speakers run through continuously and then we'll stop for uh, our question and answers for the first four speakers in that respect. So um, can we have our next speaker? How many is it? Are you, can you get, share your screen? Brilliant. Hello. Yes, okay. yes. Can you all hear me at the back? Hopefully so. <laughs> okay. So I'm Hermione. I'm a co-founder of Permetrics. Peter's asked me to come along and tell you a bit today about using sensor and smart meter technology to help meet the retrofit challenge in housing. Um, so this is what I am proposing to do. So a bit of background. Permetrics is a Cambridge-based business. Uh, over the last few years, we've developed a sophisticated environmental monitoring solution that helps building owners understand more about the performance performance of their assets. Now, this has largely been used in commercial sites up to now, but uh, over the past couple of years, we've become increasingly interested in housing and particularly what we can learn about fabric performance in housing. And the reason this interests us is that, you know, when there are 27 million homes in the country that require retrofit, as Peter was saying earlier, we have got to move rapidly. So how do you decide what needs to be done to which homes first? And this is really a data question. And the challenge is that the existing data sets that are used, principally the energy performance certificate data set, have some shortcomings when it comes to allocating retrofit budgets. And these shortcomings are partly about accuracy on their own terms. There are plenty of evidence and anecdotal evidence that EPCs can suffer from some systemic flaws, but they're also partly about the quality of the information and disaggregating the EPC scores to help you understand what needs doing. I won't go into this slide in too much detail, but it shows you 400 homes um, ranked by their EPC and also by the energy intensity for each home. And my problem with this particular slide is not so much that within each band there's, there are homes that are high consumption. That's somewhat to be expected. The challenge is that for anyone considering a retrofit, it's hard to unpick why that, uh, that, that consumption is high. It could be occupant behavior, it could be very inefficient building systems, it could be poor fabric. Without knowing the detail, it's difficult to get insights into what you need to do next. So recognizing this, over the last couple of years, the Department for Business and Environment have been funding research into alternative ways of looking at housing performance. And they've chosen to focus on heating. Fairly obviously, heating is generally the home's biggest contribution to carbon emissions. So they've been principally delivering this through a competition called SMETA, and that's focused on ways to move from modeling heat loss, which is the approach taken in EPCs at the moment, to actually measuring it in situ. When you have real measurements of how homes perform when they're occupied, these fabric, you can start to target fabric upgrades where you really need them, and you can monitor what works and what doesn't work. So Permetrics have been one of a number of businesses developing tools under the SMETA project um, with a target to develop a solution that could maybe augment rather than replace EPC and looking at ways to work with partners who deliver energy assessment and who work within housing. And we really focused on delivering um, understanding fabric performance because it, um, investment in improvements don't come cheap. 
we need to be able to maximize the ROI from such investment. Now, if you're a landlord who's got a lot of homes to improve, the business case for retrofit is broadly based on avoiding costs from maintenance and tenants arrears, and potentially on an uplift in fabric and property values. Now these costs can vary with the real performance of the fabric. So you can see that an EPC that doesn't report the fabric performance accurately can really result in a significant misallocation of funds. On the left, for example, an 8,000 pound budget for a house with a nominal EPCC. In the middle is the return, a landlord would get of the fabric actually is closer to a B. But in the worst case, that money might have gone to, um, could have been placed into dealing with the house on the right, where the fabric's actually closer to a D which would have offered a much more substantial uplift in ROI and also in lifestyle improvements for the people living in the home. So to tackle this sort of problem requires a solution that not only provides a robust measurement, but can do it in a way that works with existing market practices because we need to get a chance of scaling these particular benchmarks um, and getting them into the marketplace. And warm score is our solution to the challenge of how to effectively measure fabric performance. We're combining energy data from meters and environmental data to produce up-to-date and credible measurements of heat loss for any type of home, occupied or empty. We're using a small tool set of sensors that can be deployed very quickly, move from home to home, so it should be easy to incorporate into any site visit, such as an energy assessment, maybe a stock survey or a maintenance visit. Our current prototype is piloting with social housing, housing landlords in the, across the UK. The idea here is that a surveyor goes in, fits maybe four, five sensors in a home. That should take less than 20 minutes. We leave them in situ for around three weeks. And during that period, we're collecting the energy data as well as the environmental data, send it to our cloud platform, to feed into a heat loss calculation engine. Um, typically, we collect the energy data either from smart meters or from retrofitted energy monitors. And the result serves up on our dashboard of performance figures for each house. These include not only the heat loss figure, but also information on condensation risk and air quality in the home, other factors that affect retrofit decisions. So right now for heat loss, we're delivering a result that looks at a figure for the whole house. Home. And that's useful for prioritizing which homes should be invested in, also for benchmarking improvements that a project might have delivered. In the future, we are going to be adding other data sources like tariff information and data on the improvements that different upgrades have produced in the, in the past. So we can begin to predict the savings available from retrofitting different types of insulation. And we're looking at options to take the figure for heat loss for the whole home, and break it down into estimates of heat loss for different components. But also do any of this relies on us having confidence on the foundational calculation. This was part of the original Bayes research project. I'm pleased to say that we performed very well in last winter's testing um, and provided a very high degree of correlation with the gold standard test for heat loss that was used in over 30 homes where we were tested with tight confidence intervals. So in terms of what we're offering to the market, we're offering a tool set and associated analytics our customers are mostly landlords, energy assessors, surveyors. They buy a set of sensors and a license to the web platform, and that can be used in unlimited numbers of homes to build up a data set of the performance of each of these homes. One of the advantages of working with what's a fairly mature IoT platform is that it comes fully featured with things like an API, data security and privacy, which have been tried and tested over years of projects on commercial sites. And in the long term, we think performance data like this should reduce uncertainty around retrofit projects. It can underpin the growth of a range of related services, in fact. Um, we think things like data-led assessments and advice by PAS 2035 already allow for using data to validate the success of complex projects. So this is just the next step. And with financial data, as I mentioned, we have the opportunity to deliver better forecasting on the value of improvements and that should be of interest to anyone improving, uh, providing green finance products. It's really important, we think, to retrofit attractive to own occupiers who are typically deterred by upfront costs. So, and finally, by demonstrating improvement, the performance data we provide can help manufacturers better understand their offering, should make it easier for them to 
offer things like warranties and related services. And this is all about reducing uncertainty and risk around retrofit projects. We think that's what's needed to stimulate this marketplace. So that's where we're at. We're looking for more opportunities, uh, obviously, to pilot warm score through the rest of the year. If you have housing pro projects or products where you're keen to get better performance data, we'd really be delighted to hear from you. We're very open to working you know, across the country uh, and building our portfolio of work. Thanks very much. I hand over to the next speaker now, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Which is, I reckon that's myself. Uh, one second, I'm just going to share my screen in a moment. Um, could you confirm a uh, thumbs up if, if uh, you yep. can see my okay. head? Excellent. Okay, so perfect. Thank you very much, uh, for uh, Peter, for the invitation. Uh, it's really nice to see so many people on, on the chat. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Agnes Toku. I'm the uh, co-founder and managing director of AIRX. We are a London-based uh, technology startup to tackle uh, fuel poverty in social housing. So a little bit of a background and history. About uh, 10 years ago, I joined an energy, an energy advisory organization as a lead assessor. Uh, and during these years, uh, I led the delivery of a few tens of thousands of fuel poverty assessments. Uh, so during these surveys, we assessed which households are suitable uh, for what type of energy efficiency intervention and how they can access grants. So this experience was a really good uh, field experience to see what the real issues are in, in real people's homes when it comes down to damp and uh, cold, cold drafts, especially in homes of those who, who really struggle to pay their energy bills. So this is where the inspiration came from. And uh, here comes the problem. So poorly insulated and drafty homes uh, are of course contributing to a huge amount of the, around 26% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, we are all familiar with this problem but only recently has it been uh, discovered that actually air bricks are responsible for uh, quite a significant uh, proportion of this uh, heat loss. So these are air ventilation holes that provide natural airflow typically found at subfloor level or at room level within the home. So the level of heat loss uh, on an aggregated UK level could be as high as 34,000 gigawatt hour per year energy waste. So it's a seemingly small problem, but it has a huge impact. But at the same time, if occupants are blocking these air vents permanently, uh, which happens a lot in practice, it could cause unintended consequences and condensation issues, uh, which is risking people's health. Um, not only the NHS is, uh, is spending uh, unnecessary amounts on um, health issues caused by damp, but also the social landlords have to bear the enormous amount of damp damage repairs. So we realized we needed to find a way to somehow balance these two contradicting issues of energy efficiency, thermal fabric uh, efficiency, and also uh, air exchange. Uh, so this is what AIRX uh, does. It's an IoT enabled smart ventilation control. To put it simply, it's an intelligent air brick. Uh, it has inbuilt sensors to analyze and, mo and monitor the environmental conditions like temperature, humidity, and some aspects of air quality. And it's cloud-based algorithm automatically regulates the airflow. So uh, essentially the air bricks are replacing the, uh, the AIRX units are replacing the traditional air bricks like for like. And uh, when the system is closed, it maintains the thermal comfort by improving the fabric performance. But when it's open, it assists with um, moisture prevention by, by providing sufficient airflow. So the two key flagship products, the AIRX is suitable for subfloor level, uh, for uh, properties with suspended ground floor, typically pre-19, uh, 20s, 30s, uh, but uh, the air room product is above floor level and that's suitable for pre-1970s pre uh, properties. And within the air room product, it's also important that the uh, indoor air quality information, with, with that information, the system can build a fairly accurate picture about occupancy. So we can actually dig down into the root cause of what, what, what is causing the real uh, damp issues. Is it occupancy behavior problem? Is it structural problem, et cetera? Um, and also importantly uh, to know that the newly introduced uh, uh, 
uh, past 2030, which is now going to be replaced by 35, requires the no insulation without ventilation rule. So putting much more emphasis on avoiding unintended consequences, uh, which is important to, to address, uh, but in, in a monitor controlled way. Um, the AREC system can be installed in a quick and cost effective uh, way, just within less than an hour per property. Um, and validation is, is the most important uh, part. So throughout the last few years, we conducted a series of independent validations on the savings impact. Um, and we managed to prove that uh, the AREC system achieves about 12% uh, whole house heat loss uh, reduction. So the, the study that I would like to highlight is the very robust um, independent study, which was part of the eco innovation trial. Uh, so this was a, Eric's was a technology approved by Obgem uh, under, under this scheme. So during this six month trial, we collected uh, in situ data, so measured um, the performance, the actual final energy consumption, and also real-time indoor and subfloor temperatures uh, measured in situ U value. So we collected about 6 million data points, uh, analyzed uh, the data uh, with uh, independent researchers and statisticians, um, and we were really pleased about the results. Um, so as, as a result of that, the AREX product becomes a really attractive small measure within the retrofit energy efficiency uh, world. Um, so a lot of the interventions have uh, quite a long payback and, and there's a lot of hassle uh, to, to fit them. But if we are looking at the easy to install and quick payback solutions like loft or cavity wall insulation, they are fantastic, but the, the market for these products are already saturated. So installers uh, are struggling to find suitable properties, whereas Eric sits in a great sweet spot with a fast payback and a, a large untapped potential market. So essentially our mission is uh, to fight fuel poverty. Uh, we know that this is not, uh, it, it's only a part of the solution. Um, it's, it's a lot much bigger picture that we are part of, but we do think that it's, it's an important part because uh, we provide a low risk solution that has an immediate impact and it pays back fast. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I will stop sharing and uh, pass it on to uh, Ignis, I think. Yes, uh, let me just share my screen. Let me know if you can see that. Yep, brilliant, thanks. Yeah. All right, well, hello everyone. My name is Ignaz Bolshakovas. I'm the co-founder of Homely and the principal engineer at Evergreen Energy. Today, I'll share with you about how to make heat pumps smarter using dynamic electricity tariffs. To begin with, why are heat pumps the smart choice? Well, heat pumps are a renewable, low running cost alternative to gas boilers or any other traditional heating system. They use naturally occurring energy from surroundings to heat your home affordably and reliably. Heat pumps use heat from the outside air or ground and electricity to produce hot water for the radiators and hot water tank. On average, swapping from LPG or oil saves 30% on heating bills and cuts carbon emissions by 80%. A standard gas boiler typically has an efficiency of around 90%, whereas the standard heat pump coefficient of performance is between three to 400, with modern ones closer to 400% and above. Ground source heat pumps can reach up to 500%. Well, you might now think, how can the efficiency go above 100%? The way that efficiency is calculated is by comparing the energy coming in to the heat coming out. While gas boilers lose some of that energy, the heat pumps multiply the heat coming out by using free energy coming from the air or ground. In the UK, there are a couple of funding options for heat pumps to avoid barriers for adoption, democratizing the benefits across all demographics. Dynamic electricity tariffs are smart too. The majority of the UK households pay fixed prices for electricity. However, an alternative exists. Dynamic and tidal views electricity tariffs are well tested and boast an increasing popularity in Europe. The UK market is also beginning to mature 
when electricity suppliers entering with such innovative tariffs. The traditional fixed tariffs have a static rate throughout the day. And more advanced ones, such as economy seven or economy 10, usually have two. By comparison, dynamic tariffs can have a different rate every 30 minutes. This gives customers the ability to view the prices they will be paying beforehand and empowers them to make well-informed decisions around those costs. The electricity price, just as pretty much everything else, depends on demand and supply. Even in these different times, the rhythms of life continue. When factories start production or the working day ends and the kettles go on, demand goes up and the prices peak. During the quiet hours or when there is more power generated by solar or wind power plants, the prices fall. A simple example of the daily prices can be seen on the graph. It has a large peak from around 4 to 7 p.m. and significantly lower prices overnight and in the afternoon. On some occasions, when there is an abundance of renewable energy in the grid, prices could fall below zero, meaning you get paid to heat your home, charge your car, or even make a cup of tea. Although heat pumps are a smart choice for the future, they don't know the tariff you're on. There's a missing piece. Without it, we would have to dedicate our own time to perform constant analysis of electricity prices and manually change our heating schedules. So what sits between the heat pump and the tariff to bring this all together? It's a smart thermostat. Smart thermostats such as Hive, Nest, Tado have been on the market for quite a few years and are well established for standard methods of heating. They help understand your heating usage, adapt your schedules based on your lifestyle, know when to leave home to save energy and many other smart things. However, they're not assigned with heat pumps in mind. Smart thermostats have even greater potential for heat pumps, especially when combined with variable electricity tariffs. By rounding out the circle, they increase the value of all the component parts, further reductions in carbon emissions, greater savings for the customer, and less stress on the grid. If the thermostat can already use critical tariff data, could it be combined with other data sources to get even smarter? Thermal dynamics inside the house is a complicated subject. The heating and cooling rates of a house are governed by many things. The one thing that underpins it all is the weather, forecast of temperature, humidity, cloud coverage, and others. Warmer external conditions mean less heating and electricity required, and cooler conditions mean the opposite. So let's feed the local weather conditions into the smart thermostat and let it make informed decisions on the fly. But what can we learn from inside the house? By deploying sensors around home, the smart thermostat learns the house. It knows how long the house takes to heat up and cool down, and based on this information, adapts the heating schedules. This ensures the smartest possible heating schedules using the smartest possible application of the dynamic tariffs on a heat pump that was a smart choice in the first instance. And does such a smart thermostat exist? It does. The only smart thermostat does everything I've just covered, pulls dynamic electricity tariffs from the provider, combines them with the weather forecast and sensors around the home to better optimize the heat pump schedules, all controlled from an easy to use app in the customer's home. Heat pumps and dynamic electricity tariffs are the smart way forward. So taking you back to the question at the start of the presentation, how do you make heat pumps smarter using dynamic electricity tariffs? By putting a purpose-built smart thermostat at the heart of everything. However, this is only the beginning of the story. We're also working on linking solar PV, solar thermal, electric vehicles, and home batteries together with heat pumps to make our smart thermostat the beating heart of the smart home. To find out more about Homely and other innovative services and solutions available, at Evergreen Energy, just drop me a note. Thank you very much. Hello, hi everyone. I'm Huai, um, a research associate from Cambridge Zero. Cambridge Zero is a cross departmental initiative um, and serves as Cambridge University's response to climate crisis. Currently, I'm working on this uh, 
project high resolution thermal infrared space telescopes for globally monitoring the energy efficiency of buildings. We are at a relatively beginning stage of the development. So we're engaging with potential stakeholders to explore use cases and subsequent user requirements that can be fed back into the satellite prototype design um, as, as well as developing the business case. And the satellite is looking to be launched in two years time by 2023 at the earliest. And so um, previous speakers have already more or less introduced the significance of retrofitting built environment towards achieving net zero. And uh, one of the wider phenomenon that we have discovered in terms of building energy performance is a performance gap. In one of my previous uh, projects that has done uh, doing my master's at Cambridge, that I have examined the Brunswick Center as a case study to have taken as a, a, a monitored and modeled um, and to have uh, demonstrated that behavioral variations can result in more than um, five times uh, than the physical retrofit alone, as you can see um, from this graph. And the red arrow represents the, a change of behavior from high energy behavior to low energy behavior. And that's the amount of saving that you can get. And, and the blue arrow is representing the physical improvement alone from various retrofit measures, such as the uh, installations, uh, double, triple glazing, etc. And, um, and so uh, this is one example uh, representing how behavioral aspect that can cause significant performance gap, as well as the uh, construction errors or uh, modeling assumptions. And, um, and in order to uh, tackle this challenge that we want to have better monitoring data, uh, for example, to be have better data on, the, on buildings actual performance so that realistically what we can anticipate from retrofit savings, uh, which is one of the uh, key aspects in my PhD thesis, is that because of the behavioral variations that can result in anticipated savings from retrofit uh, vary by, uh, by times of 10. Um, and it has drawn conclusion in terms of developing behavioral patterns and subsequent uh, household archetypes and, and the, the kind of optimal retrofit packages for each. And so here that we have monitoring challenges in terms of what kind of data that we can have. We do have the public available data sets such as energy performance certificates, um, display energy certificates uh, and smart metering data, energy bills and other English housing condition survey, et cetera. But, but they, there are a lot of assumptions embedded in the certificates, energy performance certificates, for example, and they are not uh, completely covering the housing stock 27 million that we want to retrofit in terms of existing uh, housing stock. And, and they turn not to be up to date. So every 10 years, they, they are only uh, re legally required to have that uh, update. And, and many of the stock, half of the stock doesn't have uh, the EPC available, for example. And, um, and we think that by having thermal infrared thermography available uh, in terms of detecting heat loss, the actual adding on the actual performance um, monitoring, it can very much help to complement the existing data set we have and to contribute towards a better anticipation of retrofit services deliveries, as well as allocation of investment. And um, traditionally, um, thermography has been done using handheld cameras. And so this is the example, the image shows an example of handheld thermal imagery, uh, thermal imaging cameras. And so um, it's essentially a visual display of the amount of infrared energy emitted, transmitted and reflected by an object. And, um, and so the satellite thermal imagery, uh, thermal imaging technique that we are proposing is a high resolution, um, which means uh, only a few meter ground sample distance that can actually see the individual buildings. It's still in de development stage, so um, that we, um, so we're, we, we don't have exact uh, sample image here, 
Um, but this is an um, example image from NASA database to show you indication of uh, what you might expect in terms of, for example, comparing before and after um, a, a intervention and to see how you can detect um, the energy changes, energy use changes in, in large scale. And, um, and so in terms of a proof of concept study, we carried out drone uh, survey, drone thermal infrared um, imaging survey uh, using Cambridge Estates case study. And so this is a, a one of the a sample that we have collected so far from Western Cambridge. So it's a cluster there, including uh, some of the buildings such as university information service buildings, uh, Cavendish Laboratory, Maxwell Center, etc. And so you can see the names on the uh, on the left hand, and um, the image shows the uh, temperature reflected um, and um, and emitted by the by the building roofs mostly, and you can see some of the facades as well. Um, here, I want to just note down that uh, some of the roofs that you see having a um, very dark color, it's not because they're actually very cold, it's because some of the materials, because of their emissivity, they reflect the sky temperature. And so they, they might not be as efficient as what you might assume from this color uh, image, but they are just uh, reflecting um, the, the sky color. And so we're due to processing more data on this and to, um, we're having life and uh, life energy data sets and to see the correlation. And so in the meantime, well, we have um, uh, organized um, lots of interviews, a couple of dozen interviews with various organizations that are involved in retrofitting homes, retrofitting buildings. And it ranges from government to industry and to community action groups. And so here is a, is a flavor, you can see what kind of types of organizations that we have interviewed so far. Um, and uh, among the use cases, we have identified three key components of use cases uh, in terms of the area focusing on investment decision making and identifying opportunities. And this is on the aspect where, for example, the, if the government wants to identify which area to target, local councils want to see where uh, the people are, are more poor performing, so they can allocate funding uh, for better use, or they want to see where their funding can yield the highest uh, investment return, so give them better ROI, return of investment. And they could also be used by um, consultants identifying client projects and to see uh, to initiate such opportunities um, by having a scan through of the areas they're looking at. And, and second is to ha have that uh, quality control and tracking. So a lot of retrofit projects has been done, but are they achieving what they are uh, set to design to achieve in terms of energy saving and carbon emission reduction? And most most cases, the um, th there is a wider gap, and the answer is no. And so um, to help to better uh, tracking of what is designed is, uh, is actually what's achieved. This can be used to have a pre-work monitoring and post-work monitoring for better quality control and to keep track of how uh, overall, uh, whether, whether we are on track of, um, of uh, achieving what the investment is set to do. Um, and also it can verify the quality of the work, whether there are any construction errors, etc. And thirdly, that it can help consultants, uh, advisory services to give better advice, such as energy saving trusts, um, and also communication, such as government communicating with the public in terms of uh, social uh, stimulate, social ch social societal change, uh, to communicate uh, with uh, persuade um, people to to take up increased their take up of retrofit opportunities and measures. And so these are the three uh, key components that we have uh, summarized. And, um, and in terms of the kind of uh, specification that we can fit into the prototype design of the satellite, we identify that most uh, stakeholders we have spoken with, they want to have individual building level down to the address level of ground sample resolution. So the smallest houses, perhaps mid-terrace house, which is just over three meter uh, width, 
And so we want to, um, we narrow it down to uh, just a few meters between three and six meter ground sample distance, uh, according to the kind of uh, common house types that we get here in the UK. And so I think this will be the kind of resolution that allows stakeholders to, to essentially identify the buildings that they want to look at as the initiation process. And, um, and many of the uh, people that we've spoken to also appreciate annual monitoring or even seasonal monitoring sometimes, depending on uh, what they are looking at, um, because there's also some overheating risk as well as uh, doing different temperature seasons that there are different heating patterns and and many stakeholders want to have multiple points during winter time so they can realistically anticipate the kind of uh, heat load size for um, retrofitting for, for the kind of uh, heat pumps for example or uh, the retrofit technologies that they're trying to install and um, in terms of um, the format that, that is half hard. Sorry, Huey, so, I need to stop you um, because you've run over time. Oh, I'm sorry. So um, yeah, no this is the last. Uh, this is the last one acknowledgement. So I, I would like to thank my team and um, and for more information that you can go on to this website and this my contact information if you have further queries. Thanks a lot. And um, can we have an hour, Rosalie? Hello, apologies, my internet dropped literally now, which is just the worst timing, but I'm back. Uh, can you uh, see my screen? Um, no, not yet. Yes, um, coming up now. And in fact, it's perfect timing because, go ahead. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, uh, brilliant. Well, my name is Rosalie uh, and first foremost, happy Earth Day to everyone. It's it's actually a big honor to be presenting here to this community on Earth Day uh, and I'll jump straight in. So I'm Rosalie. I'm one of the co-founders of Thermilon. We are an early stage startup working on advanced materials and specifically we're working on a new, the, on the next generation of mineral based building insulation. And specifically today, I'm going to be talking about how this can be used for solid wall homes. So just uh, to start off with, solid wall homes are typically built pre-1919. It's the Victorian terraces or the you know, 16th century country houses. And uh, they are actually notoriously difficult to insulate. The reason for that is um, they were built to breathe. So they were built to let moisture vapor pass through, uh, through the building fabric. And this means that any insulation that doesn't allow uh, this vapor permeability, like plastics-based insulation or cement-based insula cement insulation, uh, will, uh, will cause dampness and condensation problems, which can lead to fabric deterioration uh, or you know, even mold growth and the like. And this additional technical challenge is a, uh, is a reason why these homes have actually been left behind in our drive for retrofit. And just to illustrate the scale of the problem, uh, out of the 29 million homes roughly that we have in the UK, 19 million of them are below our uh, EPC band C for energy rating. And out of that, just under half are, are, walls, uh, are buildings with solid, uh, solid walls. And you know, this is really astonishing considering that there's roughly eight and a half, 8.7 million solid wall homes in the UK and 8 million of them have uninsulated walls. That means that nine out of every 10 solid wall homes are not insulated. Um, that is partly because of this uh, moisture problem. And this, this is compounded by the fact that roughly a million of them are in conservation areas, which means that you can't be altering the, build, uh, the fabric of the building. And additionally, over 1 million uh, have fuel poor households as inhabitants. Uh, now, I've mentioned that uh, this is actually a material problem. So why do these homes get left behind? I, I also have a nice uh, Venn diagram. You, uh, with these homes, you need to have an insulation material that's vapor permeable, lets the moisture pass through. Uh, it's a good insulator. Uh, so I would say the rule of thumb is uh, something that's less than 0.03 watt per meter squ squared Kelvin is a good insulator, lower is better, lower value is a better insulating value. And, you know, it can't cost the earth. 
uh, in carbon terms, uh, but also literally in, in monetary terms. And you know, just to uh, cover all the bases, there are materials that are affordable and really good insulators. That uh, they're plastic based usually. These are plastic based insulation boards, EPS, BR, IPUR. But these cannot be used on those buildings precisely because of the uh, of the moisture problem. So second option is natural and mineral based insulation. So that's mineral wool, sheep's wool. It can be wood fiber boards, and these materials are actually pretty amazing and some of them can be sequestering a lot of carbon and uh, I'm actually fond of them, very fond of them myself. The trouble with them is uh, you would struggle to get a natural or mineral based insulation that is lower than 0.035 ish watt per meter squared Kelvin. There is a, a third option, which is these, you know, uh, very advanced materials called aerogels usually come in, uh, in bats or on boards. Problem with them is they're very expensive. So, you know, in between uh, all these uh, criteria, there is the spot in the middle, the sweet spot. And this is where we in Thermion uh, come in and the new material which we've developed. So what we've developed is uh, silica-based aerogels. Aerogels, we make them in powder form. Uh, they are amazingly insulating materials. They're actually 95% made of air. Uh, which means that uh, there are highly, highly porous materials and the pores are so small that they minimize heat convection, which is the transfer of heat uh, through air. And because there's so little material backbone, they also minimize heat conduction. This is what makes them such good insulins. We make them in powder form, which means that they can be integrated into other building materials. And for the problem of solid wall homes, what we do is we take aerogels and we integrate them into lime renders and lime plasters. So the, uh, the outcome is a, a highly insulating lime plaster or lime, lime render, which remains very breathable. Now, you might be asking yourselves, well, you know, there's other aggregates that I can use, uh, other insulating aggregates uh, in plasters and renders that I can use to insulate at home. Uh, we've asked ourselves the question too, which is why we did a little case study for a heritage home 20, uh, 22 centimeters solid brick wall. And we wanted to achieve U value that is to building regulations. So that's, uh, uh, for those of you who know, that's uh, 0.3 U value. Um, and, you know, there's three options I'm gonna consider now. The first one of them is to uh, use uh, expanded mineral like perlite or uh, vermiculite as the insulation. Now, because we're considering a heritage home, our cement free uh, lime render has a thermal conductivity of 0.125. You might remember from the uh, previous slide that uh, you know that's three times three times more than uh, what I had as a threshold of good insulation, the 0.03. So that's three times less insulating, and that means that you know you'd need quite a thick buildup to achieve uh, the target U value to building racks racks over 30 centimeters. And that requires a lot of material and then it requires a lot of installation costs. Uh, option number two is cork based materials. Their thermal conductivity is, you know, very good for a plaster. It's, uh, you know, it's not under the threshold of 0 0.03, but it's good. So you can reduce the thickness to down to a third. And even though, you know, the price per bag is, uh, might be seen by some as quite high, when you actually consider the price per insulating thickness, it again, it can be down to a third uh, compared to a less, uh, less um, insulating plaster, just because of the reduction in thickness. And you may see where I'm uh, leading on with this, uh, which is, you know, if you use uh, aerogels the way we make them, uh, you can get a render or a plaster with a really low uh, thermal conductivity, which means that you can get the thickness of the insulation even lower. And for the price for the insulation value, you can get the price even lower. Now we're still in product development, so I can't, uh, you know, quite disclose numbers quite yet. But we know that we can get beyond the cork price point. Um, other considerations that are really important to us is, uh, you know, how much embodied carbon there is. Our process for producing our gels designs out cost, make them cheaper, but it also designs out carbon cost. Um, we are committed to circular economy and we have an ongoing research stream incorporating waste materials into, uh, into our own production process as, as precursors. 
Uh, another advantage is that you know with uh, with any insulating uh, plus render you get a continuous insulation render and you uh, minimize thermal bridging. And last but not least, as I said, uh, we're very early in uh, on our journey and we're actually just starting first on site testing that's happening later this spring. We are pumped about it. I can't say how much and we're looking for more sites. Uh, we're looking for people who are interested in this who would like to collaborate uh, on any element of the things I've mentioned. And that's my eight minutes. So thanks so much for your attention. And I will very topically hand over to Andy. Done sharing? Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, can I be heard? I hope so. Yes, you can, Andy. Excellent. Thank you. And can I, at the same time, make my presentation work? Let's see. OK, is the presentation visible? Not yet, Andy, no. OK, oh, that's clever then, isn't it? How have I done that? OK, it's there, fine. OK, okay thanks, Andy. Give me a second while I make sure I get onto what I'm doing here. Here we go. Okay, so yes, topically, thank you very much. And thank you for passing over and um, maybe also slightly controversially. So um, I'm Andy Pike, my company is Proof Shield, And uh, we're a company that's all about um, turning uh, functional construction materials into energy saving materials, much like um, Rosalie was referring to. So we believe our, our approach is to, to look at building materials that are used every single day on refurbs, uh, retrofits, even on new builds, and um, materials that have currently um, functional, uh, they have, uh, their function at the moment might be protective or, or decorative, such as a render, such as a plaster, such as a screed. And we take those materials and uh, by, by uh, adding certain other things, we're turning them into, um, and, and it, we're giving them an extra function, which is insulation and uh, energy efficiency. Um, and our, our key products are uh, an insulating render plaster, um, an insulating screed. Uh, and we're doing this by using materials, um, natural mineral in insulating aggregates, which are widely available. These are um, volcanic uh, products. So they're, they're minerals that are, have um, moisture trapped in them. And when you apply heat to them, uh, this is like perlite and pumice. Uh, with the application of heat, they pop like popcorn, expand to about 20 times their existing size and trap uh, huge amounts of air bubbles inside them. And these air bubbles create an insulating coat effect. So what we end up with by using these insulating aggregates are products that can be applied to external walls, internal walls and floors. They're strong enough and well tested in the UK. Um, we've been on the market in the UK with these products uh, since 2018 and we're currently um, shipping um, one to two container loads a month. Uh, and they're used across the UK and Ireland from um, the north to the south. Um, and these products are, um, they're taking the place of, of, of a straightforward decorative render, a straightforward decorative uh, plaster or a straightforward um, functional screed. And they're changing them into products that are lightweight, fire resistant, insulating, breathable, um, and certainly eco-friendly. Um, there is, sorry, one more, here we go, uh, a very short video uh, which just illustrates it's not fantastic, but it does kind of get the point across.
So there you go. That's our insulating render product, Proof Therm. It's, it's on the market. It's widely distributed. Um, a little correction there to Rosalie. Um, per, expanded perlite has a um, watts per meter square Kelvin um, thermal conductivity of 0 0.04. Um, and then depending how you mix it and what you put it together with, we end up with, we end up with a finished product with a 0 0.06 watts per meter square Kelvin. Um, so applicable depths, 20 mil to 100 mil, excuse me. <coughs> um, and uh, we end up with a product that's, uh, it's simple to use, it's extremely cost effective, it's natural mineral based, it's highly breathable. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>